We're here at the 3GP plenary in Lisbon and joining me now are Tero Pessinen, who is technical chair of TCCA, and Adrian Scrace, who is head of mobile competency at 3GPP. Tero, I'd like to ask, uh, we'd like to start talking about the mission critical communication side of, of 5G. Um, you're the technical chair of the TCCA. Can you explain to us the progress that has been made so far on the evolution of Tetra to LTE? Well, quite a lot of work has obviously been done here in, in 3GPP starting in, in, well, really it's 12, I suppose, it's, it's fair to say. MCPTT came in, in 13, the first part, and now three releases later, it's, it's uh, becoming fairly, fairly uh, completed. Work has continued in release 15 and uh, with the MCP, MC data, uh, MC video. And I, I think that the bulk of things required for mission critical is pretty much much there with, uh, with release 16 now. And what about the state of interworking between the two technologies? That is a, a strategic question uh, per nation, per networks. But quite many nations recognize that the operation, operational scenarios, operational capabilities of, of users is gradual. And, and uh, you need to make sure that the coverage is there. You need to make sure that the network availability and reliability is there and the features are there. So it actually makes sense to utilize the 3GPP LTE capabilities, which are available in the networks today, fundamentally in data. And then once the voice services have been deployed, then shift the, the people. So yes, the, the uh, interworking is immensely important. So what progress has SA made on mission critical communications and what's going to happen to SA6? Um, when the mission critical work was proposed to be introduced within 3GPP, we understood that this required a specific focus and so a specific group was generated uh, particularly to take care of that which is called SA6. Um, the, the first piece of work which that group tackled was mission critical voice. Uh, this was at the request of the user community that said actually we, you know, we need to get mission critical push to talk working and working correctly. Uh, that work has been completed, um, followed soon after by mission critical data and mission critical video because the, the user community is saying that um, in, a, in an, an emergency scenario, voice is not sufficient. They need to be able to stream mission critical video. They need to, need to exchange mission critical data. And, and that required a specific focus, which SA6 has um, pretty much completed, I would say. The, the work is, is there, and it's the basis on which early deployments will be made. How much of a challenge has it been for you to adapt to these new requirements? I mean, it sounds very simple just to add mission critical voice, mission critical data and mission critical video to an existing standard. But actually, this was a significant piece of work and we, we should really recognise um, the experts that have worked long and hard to achieve that because it, it wasn't just a simple matter of adapting an existing system. It, it required considerable thought and care because this is a very bespoke user group and this is not any user group. These are the blue light services which are a very demanding user group and, and we need to make sure that the standards absolutely deliver what is required. Terra, I understand you're extending the inclusion of the broadband community in the TCCA by creating a broadband industry group. Why is that? Well, uh, for the vendors, vendors, this mission critical part is in the end of the day is, is a fairly significant but small segment. And it's quite important that they, their people in this sector, meet each other and can align their views on these related things. And, and that enables them to have kind of like a home to discuss specifically these things, whereas as generically they would be focusing in across the board all kinds of topics. So that's one, one part we have, have done and it, it uh, seems to be bearing fruit already. So Adrian, what do you say to emergency services, blue light users who are thinking about buying a new system who say, well, why should I buy an LTE system today? Because if I wait a short while, I'll get a 5G system. I think that's a very interesting point, but one that's not actually um, 
limited to uh, public safety or mission critical. It applies to, to all of the, the, the system users. You know, why shouldn't I just wait for 5G and, and why would I invest now? And I think it's important to understand that the, the 5G radio, which we've defined here this week, is not intended as a replacement for the 4G radio, at least not for many, many years to come. It will be a complement. So in most cases, you will see um, within a wide area, you will see both 4G LTE and 5G new radio deployed in that same geographical space. So it's not really a matter of do I choose 4G or do I choose 5G. In most cases, you will, you will use both. It will be a complementary uh, system. So there, there is no point in waiting for 5G unless you are looking at very limited geographical um, deployment, uh, certainly not in the case of public safety where we're looking at uh, wideband systems. Furthermore, what we, we see in, in particular relation to 5G and the new verticals, we expect the uh, convergence to happen in the society. We expect the, the society to demand overall the same availability and reliability which has been more the kind of a special requirement of of public safety in the past and when when 5g networks have to deliver that to consumers to enterprises and all the other verticals well more the merrier in that sense so so we believe that this will really contribute in in many ways to public safety but to everyone else as well Fascinating work, fascinating discussion. Gentlemen, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.